Can you hear me at the back? Can you hear me? Yes? OK. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the Robert Goodland Memorial Lecture this afternoon. The lecture is sponsored by the 1818 Society of the World Bank. And we have had tremendous support from John Min and the Goodland family in organizing this event. We are very happy to have John Min with us here. And we are also very happy to have Dr. Pachuri, who is well known to most of you. And I will go ahead with the formal introduction of the speaker a few minutes later. But before we do anything else, let's spend a moment of silence remembering our dear friend, Robert Goodland. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Being a society with a large number of elderly, we observe these minutes of silence, allowing people to sit or stand as they can do. But it's very nice to have you all here this evening. Let me first say a few words about the 1818 Society, because many of you are members, but a few of you are not. And I'll be very brief. 1818 Society is an association of the retirees of the World Bank but we now call it an association of the alumni of the World Bank because retirees are generally looked at as liabilities and alumni are looked at as assets. <laughs> we have 6,000 members all around the world and our number is growing. And basically we take care of the fiduciary issues relating to pension and medical insurance and taxes. But more importantly and more recently, we have gone into the business of networking, both knowledge and social networking using the electronic advancements that are available at our disposal. So that is the 1818 Society. We have a number of uh, chapters in various parts of the world. We have nine of them. We also have nine to 10 thematic groups. And I'm very happy to say on this occasion that uh, we are going to establish a thematic group for environment and social today. I had asked Robert Woodland when I last met him as to whether he would take the leadership of it. And he told me, I'm very busy now, I'm traveling, but when I come back, I promise I'll see you and take it over. So we think it's really fitting that we have it in place today. And I'm happy to announce that the two people who are co-leading this are no less than Michael Chernier, who was the first socialist who joined the bank, and Lee Talbot, whom all of you know. So the two of them would this and probably our first event would be in June, and we would take off with that. So it's, uh, I'm very happy to announce that. I'm also very happy to um, uh, welcome Dr. Pachuri to our midst today. Uh, he's very well known, he's eminent, he's a celebrity, and he's famous. But nevertheless, I thought I should just say a few words about him to introduce him to you, and then we can proceed with his talk. After his talk, there'll be some, some of the friends of Robert sharing the thoughts for a few minutes each, and then we'll have uh, ideas and uh, suggestions from the floor, issues raised from the floor, and then we'll request Dr. Pachuri as and when he finds it convenient or thinks it's necessary to intervene and to run the debate on that basis. Dr. Rajendra K. Pachuri is an internationally acclaimed leader on environment and energy issues and their policy dimensions. He is best known as chairman of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the world's leading intergovernmental organization for the assessment of climate change. Dr. Pachuri, who saves on a voluntary basis, was elected chairman in 2002 and re-elected by acclamation in 2008. The IPCC, along with former US Vice President Al Gore, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2007. Dr. Pachuri's day job, if I may call it that, is a CEO of the New Delhi-based Terry, the Energy and Resources Institute. Dr. Pachuri oversees more than 1,200 employees engaged in research and development solutions to global problems in the field of energy, environment, and current patterns of development. Dr. Pachuri has held numerous academic positions and was the founding director of the Yale University Climate and Energy Institute from July 2009 through to June 2012, 
following which he was appointed senior advisor to the same institute. He is also currently Professor of Practice of Sustainable Development at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, Honorary Professor of the University of Eastern Finland, and Chancellor of Terry University. He has co-authored over 130 peer-reviewed papers and written or co-written 27 books. Most of them are um, among about energy and environment. I hope I have my data up to date. Now, a little known but fascinating facet of his character is that Pachuri is a keen cricketer, and I am sure many of you are very interested in cricket, well honed with skills as a seam and swing bowler. His vision has led to the creation of a Terry Oval in Delhi, known as Patchy Greens, I'm told, one of the finest and most scenic cricket grounds in India, which is now recognized as a venue for first-class matches. Several international cricketers enjoy visiting and playing at Patchy Greens. Dr. Pachuri's remarkable achievement of 600 wickets in corporate cricket for Terry is a milestone few can aspire to match in the near future. <clears throat> but above all, Dr. Pachuri is a close personal and professional friend of Robert Goodlett, and it's a great honor for us to have him deliver the Robert Goodland Memorial Lecture today. Dr. Pachuri, may I invite you to make a presentation? Mr. Shiv Kumar, Mrs. John Min Goodman, Mr. Arthur Goodland, Mr. Arthur Goodland, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this is a moment of deep emotion for me because um, Robert Goodland was not only a person that I felt very close to as a friend, but also in philosophical terms in terms of what he believed in and what he stood for. And therefore, you'll forgive me if I am a bit overcome by emotion on this occasion. I never thought that I would be here in Washington, D.C. Uh, on this occasion, where quite apart from remembering all that he did, we must also make a firm commitment to uphold the values that he stood for and what he believed in. I had read about Robert uh, for several years. I was aware of his work, but I actually met him in 1990 because I came here for three months as a research fellow, uh, and therefore I'm not a retiree, but I am an alumnus of the World Bank in that respect. And I don't know if you still have that scheme, but that was a wonderful arrangement whereby they selected people who came to the World Bank and spent limited periods of time researching on something that they wanted to work on without promising any kind of output. So that was a wonderful opportunity to really do things that I uh, was interested in. And at that stage, I had become very deeply interested in the science of climate change and its implications for, for human society. So it was then that I met Robert, and we would often lunch together. And after lunch, he would say, let's go for a walk. So we'd go for a long walk down Constitution Avenue all the way back. And um, that had become a routine. And you know, during the course of that walk, we talked about various things, and we got to know each other. More recently, our interests coincided because uh, he really got interested in the whole livestock sector and the emissions from greenhouse gases that uh, emanate from that sector. And I have um, been um, hit on the head several times for suggesting that people should eat less meat. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, I was the um, 
target of several efforts to discredit me, to criticize me way back in 2010. But um, one of the things that people leveled as a charge against me was that this, this Hindu vegetarian, I mean, they thought my vegetarianism was driven by the fact that I was born a Hindu. But the reality is I gave up eating meat um, about 15, 16 years ago, largely because of what I saw as the environmental and climate change implications. So that's an area where Robert and I certainly intersected in uh, our concerns. Um, Robert was not just an intellectual. He was a person who inspired, who motivated people to do the right thing. And uh, going through his, uh, his background, I realized that for his master's degree, he went to Guyana, of all places. And I have a connection with that country because about a year and a half ago, I accepted chairmanship of the Iwokrama International Center, which is about a million acres of pristine rainforest, which has been offered to the global community as an example of how rainforests should be managed on a sustainable basis. Um, he was very sensitive to indigenous people. And I suppose this is something he acquired in the time that he spent in Guyana and then later for his PhD work in Brazil. Uh, this is um, an important part of the legacy of those people who are dependent on forests for their sustenance, that I'm afraid the world has really not been totally attentive to. And it goes to Robert's credit that like many other things where he made a pioneering contribution, he um, highlighted uh, the importance of the indigenous people being at the center of development where some of these rich forest resources are concerned. He worked on greening the UN system of accounts. And um, I was also very interested to read that he was responsible for establishment of the environment ministry in Indonesia, led by Emil Salim, a good friend of mine, and I'm sure a very, very good friend of Robert's as well. So here was a human being who uh, not only created outputs that had very rare intellectual quality, but something that really went to the core of ethical, equitable, and sustainable development. And I'd like to salute him on this occasion. So it's a rare privilege for me to be given this opportunity to speak in his memory and to talk about something that was very close to his heart, the whole challenge of climate change. Now, as uh, you may be aware, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the IPCC, which I have the privilege of chairing, has recently brought out three working group reports, which are part of the fifth assessment report. And what I'll present before you uh, very quickly are some of the key findings of these three working group reports. So let me start with the very first slide that I have over here. And I'd like to highlight the fact that the problem of climate change is essentially very much a part of what one might call the tragedy of the commons. Um, it was a very uh, unique biologist, Garrett Hardin, who in my view uh, came up with this observation about the tragedy of the commons, which I think is something that has gradually and increasingly entered the space of economic science, particularly in what is now developing as ecological economics. The reality is that the air we breathe, the water we drink, the soil on which we grow our food are really common property resources. We derive enormous benefits from them, but we are not responsible for their upkeep and their maintenance. And that is really the tragedy of the commons. This is what has happened with climate change. Because since the beginning of industrialization, we have emitted larger and larger quantities 
of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Uh, and even though scientists going back 150 years had told us on the basis of theoretical analysis that this could lead to a change in the Earth's climate, we basically ignored them. Now the evidence is so overwhelming and the entire scientific community, which is part of the IPCC, and as you heard, uh, this is a community that works without any compensation from the IPCC, has come up with a range of very profound findings that we possibly cannot ignore any longer. 95 um, percent, there is a certainty that human influence has been the dominant cause of observed warming since the mid-20th century. And since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. So what we've done in a short period of time is a major deviation from what has been a reasonably stable system for millennia together. Uh, and limiting climate change will require sustained and substantial reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. So this means that business as usual cannot possibly continue because the impacts of climate change will become progressively worse. One important finding that we have is that the last three decades, each decade has been successively warmer than the previous one. And these three decades have clearly been the warmest since the year 1400. And therefore, we really need to see where we are going, and I'll say a lot more in terms of the impacts of these changes. Um, what has happened is that the oceans have warmed, and on account of melting of the ice bodies across the globe and also thermal expansion of the oceans, there has been sea level rise. Amounts of snow and ice have diminished across the globe. A month from now, a little more than a month from now, I'll be going to the Arctic region, where I've been on several occasions. And it is really quite pathetic to see the rate at which Arctic sea ice is reducing. And that has major implications not only for that region, but also in respect of circulation of the oceans, because the whole salinity, salinity gradient of the Arctic region is being affected, and that has major implications for uh, uh, ocean circulation. Sea level has risen, and the concentrations of greenhouse gases have increased. Now, if you look at uh, the upper ocean, it has uh, absorbed about 90 percent of the energy that has been created as a result of climate change between the period 1971 and 2010. So in other words, if the oceans were not able to absorb that heat, then much of it would really come on the surface of the land, and that would lead to far more uh, serious impacts of climate change. And the rate of sea level rise since the mid-19th century has been larger than the mean rate during the previous two millennia. So sea level rise has been very rapid, and in fact, between the period 1901 to 2010, the average increase has been 19 centimeters. That's close to a foot. And you can imagine there are several parts of the world which are low-lying. These are small island states, low-lying coastal areas, which would be affected by this increase even before the threat of submergence really takes away those areas of land. Because every time there's a storm surge, every time there's coastal flooding, with a higher sea, the extent of damage and devastation is much higher. Um, if you look at the increase in atmospheric CO2, at the beginning of industrialization, we had 280 parts per million of uh, CO2. And uh, in, uh, in May of last year, uh, the number exceeded 400. So there's been a significant increase in uh, the concentration of greenhouse gases like CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, more than we've seen in 800,000 years. And the ocean has absorbed about 30 percent of the emitted anthropogenic carbon dioxide, and this is leading to ocean acidification. CO2 emissions from fossil fuels and the industrial sector have accounted for about 78 percent of total greenhouse gas emissions 
uh, between the period 1970 to 2010. So um, there are very basic and fundamental changes taking place in the ecology of the planet, which are affecting our climate very seriously. Where do these greenhouse gases come from? Well, this gives you a picture of the sources. Uh, on the left-hand side, you've got this circle which shows that there's a significant amount that comes from AFOLU, which is agriculture, forestry, and land use. And this is an area that Robert was focusing on increasingly in recent years. And of course, his was a voice that people found it convenient to ignore for a while, but he was such a persistent, such a determined person that I think it started making an impact. Okay. Um, globally, economic and population growth continue to be the most important drivers of increases in CO2 emissions. And these are expected to continue to drive emissions growth without additional efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we are on a pathway whereby these emissions will continue to grow very rapidly unless we bring about efforts to mitigate them on an effective basis. And AFOLU, as I mentioned, is a significant contributor to global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this is just a picture of uh, two sets of scenarios on the basis of which we have looked at temperature increases by the end of this century. The RCP 2.6 scenario is a stringent mitigation scenario, where, as a matter of fact, before the end of the century, we would actually get into a zone of negative emissions of greenhouse gases. So this is something that really represents ambition on the part of human society to do something about climate change. The 8.5 scenario is one which is really a do-nothing scenario. And the extent and the intensity of the color really shows the increase in temperatures that would take place by the end of the century according to these two particular scenarios. Now, uh, I might mention that with the 8.5 scenario, we could get a temperature increase of up to 4.8 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, and that clearly is unacceptable. We also know that oceans will continue to warm, so that has serious implications for marine life. It also has implications for the kind of catch you might get in several parts of the world, and there already is enough evidence to show that there's migration of species. Fish stock, which existed in, in, in certain parts of the world, are now moving to other areas because of the changes in temperature that are taking place. Very likely that Arctic sea ice cover will continue to shrink and thin as global mean surface temperature rises. The Arctic, as a matter of fact, is warming at twice the rate of the rest of the, the world. So uh, this really means bad news for that part of this planet. And global glacier volume will further decrease. Global mean sea level will continue to rise during the 21st century. Um, it's very likely that we will get an increase in the intensity and frequency of several extreme events. Heat waves are one of those. Extreme precipitation events are another. And extreme precipitation events mean that you'll get a huge amount of rainfall in a short period of time, rainfall or snowfall. And even in those parts of the world where you actually have a decline in average precipitation, the possibility is that a large part of it will take place in the form of heavy falls. Um, and under some scenarios, we've estimated that a 1 in 20 year hottest day or 1 in 20 year heat wave that we experience today will by the end of the century become a one in two year event. And I've already talked about heavy precipitation events. <coughs> there are <coughs> serious impacts of climate change that we need to be concerned about. <coughs> I won't go into all the details, <coughs> but food security and production systems will be affected. Livelihoods and poverty will be affected. Human health will have major impacts, not only on account of increases in these extreme events, but also 
as a result of increase in vector-borne diseases, because under the new climatic conditions, uh, certain carriers of disease will be able to proliferate and survive far better than they do today. Now, what we really need, therefore, is a combination of adaptation, because there's a certain inertia in the system, as a result of which, even if we carried out very stringent mitigation today, the impacts of climate change will continue for several decades, whether it's sea level rise or the impacts on agriculture or reduced availability of water resources, human society will have to adapt to some of these. <coughs> and <clears throat> that by itself will not be enough because we will reach certain tipping points and thresholds beyond which adaptation will, in a practical sense, not be possible at all. So globally, it's essential for us to mitigate the emissions of greenhouse gases. We've got to cut down on the emissions of greenhouse gases by which we can stabilize this increase in temperature that's taking place. And therefore, climate resilient pathways combine adaptation and mitigation to reduce climate change and its impacts. <coughs> and in the World Bank, <coughs> that's going to be extremely important <coughs> because development policies will have to come to grips in uh, combining uh, mitigation and adaptation with specific development projects and strategies. And since mitigation reduces the rate and magnitude of warming, it also increases the time available for adaptation. Because you're able to delay, you're able to reduce, and you're able to avoid some of the worst impacts of climate change. So in a sense, that gives us an opportunity to adapt far more easily and far better than would be the case otherwise. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> stringent mitigation scenarios that we've assessed require a set of measures. We'll have to lower global greenhouse gases in 2050 than in 2010, 40% uh, <clears throat> 40, 40 to 70% lower globally. Uh, emission levels near zero gigatons for C of CO2 equivalent or below in 2100. So in other words, <clears throat> by 2050, we'll have to reduce emissions significantly. And by 2100, we'll actually have to go into the zone of negative emissions. That means we should have forests, we should have carbon capture and storage, we should have a whole range of technologies by which we not only stop emitting carbon dioxide, but actually are able to suck it out of the atmosphere. And we'll need much more rapid improvements in energy efficiency. And as a matter of fact, to uh, really manage this problem effectively, we'll have to treble or quadruple the share of zero or low carbon energy supply from renewables by 2050. So, you know, in the 36 years that we have till the middle of this century, we really need to bring about a massive shift to renewables. Of course, there would also be opportunities for use of nuclear energy, biomass, fossil energy with carbon capture and storage, and bioenergy with carbon capture and storage by the year 2050. We are, of course, not recommending any of these because the IPCC is not a policy prescriptive body. We do policy relevant assessment, but the choices and decisions are left to those who are responsible for taking such decisions. Now, if we have to remove uh, carbon, then there are many scenarios for reaching 450, 500, or 550 parts per million of CO2 equivalent by 2100. I mean, you can think of it, the pathway could be a steady pathway which doesn't allow too much increase. You could have a pathway by which you allow an increase, but then bring it down very sharply. Of course, the cost of following that kind of a pathway will be much higher. Because if you allow emissions to increase, let's say over the next 10, 15, 20 years, then the impacts of climate change will become progressively more serious. And the technologies that you would have to put in place 
to reduce emissions very sharply will be that much more expensive. So I think the world has to determine <clears throat> what is optimal in terms of uh, bringing about this outcome of a stable climate in the future. Now, just to give you an indication of costs, we have assessed that for this uh, stringent mitigation, the loss in global consumption in 2030 would be roughly 1.7% of the global GDP. And in 2050, it will be 3.4% of the global GDP. And by the end of the century, less than 5% of the global GDP. Now, this clearly is not a very high price to pay <clears throat> for avoiding some of the worst impacts of climate change. What is even more uh, relevant is the fact that there are huge co-benefits from the, some of these actions. Because when you mitigate emissions of greenhouse gases, you would also bring about a higher level of energy security, uh, co-benefits in the nature of uh, local pollution being much lower, also ecosystems being preserved much better, species not being threatened, and there's also some growing evidence that employment opportunities would also be higher. But therefore, if you take all the score benefits into account, then clearly these costs which are shown over here are really not any.